My name is Bracton Lees. I'm the director of regional civics here at Boston University. Um, this is our inaugural Boston Urban Salon. We've got co organizers here. So, this is our new website. So, I just want to kind of give you the first kind of view of it. So, what are we? What do we do? Okay. So, the Boston Urban Salon, or BUS, as we'd like to know, is was our anachronism. <laughs> Is a Boston based urban seminar series that's organized by urban experts across different Boston universities and institutions. So it's not just BU, it's, it's hoping to be much more kind of inclusive. Um, it's aimed at urban scholars, practitioners, activists, basically anybody interested in cities. It could be a filmmaker, it could be anything. We're very open. Um, and we're not just interested in Boston, we're interested in cities all over the world. Um, so a very kind of open kind of format. So um, you know we can do anything from having a kind of uh, PowerPoint type sem seminar like we're going to have today to screen a documentary or a play. We can do a field trip. I mean we're literally open to ideas. Um, so once we get this kind of going a bit more, there'll be a kind of signing up that people will get kind of regular mind reminders about events. So if you kind of scroll down here, and introduce me all that within. We have a calendar that kind of talks about upcoming events. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, this is the organizers. Um, so, Julia, who unfortunately has not yet arrived, uh, Mimi Scheller, who's not yet arrived, <laughs> Liza Weinstein. Liza, you want to introduce yourself? So yeah. Hi, I'm a sociologist at Northeastern University, and I'm so excited about the first box event. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. Yeah. And then Diane. Well, I'm a sociologist also, but I, you know, masquerading as an urban planner. <laughs> Although I tell the story that Liza and I were together in sociology in the New School for Social Research. I was together and I was a student. I tried to get a PhD at MIT in planning. I know she went to Chicago, but kept me involved. I'm super happy to be involved in this. I'm very much interested in, in, in cities. Yeah, so I mean, we are the, the kind of initiating co organizers, but the idea is that this is going to widen out to other institutions like UMass or wherever, basically, in the kind of greater Boston area. Um, but the kind of hub is about making sure we're drawing urban expertise. And in doing that, what we can do is tap into people like Renee who are passing through Boston and kind of exploit them and get them to come and do a talk, <laughs> which we're very good at doing. Um, okay. Your... That's us. So let me introduce the back. Yeah. Um, that's what I say. Um, that's what I say about the bus. Although I'm not sure about the bus bit. Get on the bus. Yeah. In the wheels, so to speak. Paul Simon's bus. Oh, I know. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to introduce Dr. Rene. <laughs> um, so he's Assistant Professor in Urban Studies and Planning and also a postdoctoral research fellow in the Brussels Centre for Urban Studies in Belgium. This is one of the largest urban studies uh, centres in Europe. Um, he is really brilliant. He's a researcher on housing, migration and diversity, politics and policy, security and policing. He got a BSc in urban planning from the Technical University of Berlin in 2011, an MA in urban studies from the University of Vienna in Austria in 2014. He did geography, I'm a geographer on migration studies in 2020. Pronounced. Yeah, three. Yeah, three. Three university in Brussels. Okay, and uh, one of the reasons that I thought it was really cool to invite Rene is he's done absolutely amazing work on kind of uh, immigration policy, immigrate kind of practices around cities dealing with uh, immigrants. He is published in some of the top journals in urban studies from International Journal of Urban and Regional Research to urban geography to critical sociology, political geography. So he's a very kind of transdisciplinary scholar, a bit of geography, a bit of urban planning, a bit of sociology. Um, and yeah, I think he's worked on it. So he's going to talk about. Um, 
Thanks for mm -hmm. this place. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super happy to be here. See, uh, being a law school is my first time here. Um, and I'm constantly surprised um, mm -hmm. about the city, just because like people already know me. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, very excited. Thanks um, for the presentation. Um, I was looking over the title and the abstract that I uh, sent you guys a couple of weeks ago on the weekend. So I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> 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 it's like there's a lot in it, as you can see, multiplied displacement, what's that? What does that mean here? Governance, profit, solidarity, or migration regimes, US, Germany. So there's a lot of stuff in there. And I was like, Debating with myself whether I would like focus on one aspect or if I would, you know, tell like a broader story. And I decided to go for the latter and then put out two days. <laughs> so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on some sort of a journey with me through um, kind of like different cases that I hopefully will then relate and frame within the context of multiplying displacement, including telling you what I mean with this, with this term. Um, but why displacement? Um, I think that um, we all are aware of the fact that um, the number of people being internationally displaced has been decre uh, increasing in the past couple of years, particularly in, pa in the past 10 years. So probably safe to say that the 21st century is the century of displacement with over 1.5% of humanity being displaced or um, almost 110 million people um, in total. Um, what is interesting, of course, if we dive deeper into those numbers, looking into where people are displaced, what kind of categories are framed around those people that are displaced, as you can see here on the slide, there are um, people that are so-called refugees, um, people um, that are asylum seekers, so in procedures to apply um, for asylum, refugee status, internally displaced, people displaced within um, their country of origin, um, and what they call here, UNHCR, um, other people in need of international protection, so those that do currently not fall under any of those categories and obviously the um, places that um, people migrate to internationally um, are very diverse. Usually, as we were saying in the previous, seeing in the previous slide, it's um, with or it's to a large degree within the country or to neighboring countries, but also internationally and across continents. Um, and amongst those top ten receiving. Um, countries of internationally displaced people, this is from 2019, we have Germany and the United States as one of those um, 10 um, top receiving countries. Um, what is interesting for me as um, an urban scholar, someone that is interested in cities and city governance and urban development, urban um, processes, is that a large majority of people that are internationally displaced end up migrating mainly to cities. Um, so cities are the places um, or on the front line in dealing with the pressures caused by the arrival of displaced and asylum seeker populations. Um, there are the places where these groups negotiate their migratory projects and future trajectories or as Sanya um, says cities are the sites that are most relevant for urbanists to study the complexity of social, political, legal, and spatial transformations caused by forced migration and displacement. So we as urban scholars should be interested in um, the larger processes connected to um, displacement and their impact on um, urban development across the world in a way. Um, in the past, so I've been doing um, kind of like study, study research on asylum seeking populations, I want to say for the past 10 years. And what is interesting for me is when I started my research, 
there was not a lot of research out there, particularly in the global north. There was a lot of re research, or there is a lot of research on refugees um, in the global south, refugee camps, um, how refugee camps turn to cities, um, international governance, humanitarian governance of um, asylum seeking and refugee migrants. Um, but it has, this has changed a lot in the past um, 10 years, particularly in um, the field that I'm interested in, which is kind of like bringing together um, um, migration and urban studies, or let's say um, studying migration, asylum, refugee migration processes through an urban lens, right? So there's a lot of literature on urban refugees, governance, policy making, this personal reception procedures, detention practices here in the US, um, Australia, UK in particular, refugee camps and accommodation, particularly in Europe, for rewarding processes, um, questions related to urban citizenship, sanctuary cities, um, refugee protests, refugee movements. So they have been going on a lot in the past couple of years. But um, the the issue I take with some of the literature is, and probably that's up for debate or for our discussion now, is that a huge bulk, especially of the urban related migration research, is more or less concerned with the process of arrival and initial settlement, but does not necessarily look into longer processes, kind of like in, in um, relation to what, what happens then, what happens after people arrive somewhere, what you know processes may continue, what experiences may continue or not. Um, so kind of like more recent, recent, I mean the last two, three years, um, literature in within the field of urban um, migration studies acknowledges that displacement, as the urban scholars also know, does not only take place internationally on a global scale, but in cities of arrival immediately and often long after arrival. And obviously, if you know, urban scholars familiar with displacement, they're like, yeah, sure, of course, like displacement is one of the fun fundamental processes of urban development. <laughs> A large field of research, right? But it hasn't really applied to um, or connected with the processes um, of people that are international. Right? So, Bologna and Massa um, in their research show that many refugees and migrants in Europe today do not only have to leave their home behind, but cope with the enduring issue of finding, making, and then losing home again after. In the city of destination on my or whatever. So, what I'm interested in is the fact that asylum seeker migrants, for me and my area of ignorance and the global north, face broken cities, cities that are characterized by global housing prices, um, where they have to traverse urban spaces marked by growing levels of internal displacement, such as eviction and homelessness. While at the same time, they have to deal with the material ramifications of refugee management within disciplinary logics of market oriented governance, which includes um, legal spatial technologies such as camp, shelter, housing. In Europe, very prominent, I will talk about that dispersal procedures that disperse migrants to um, some. Um, particular regions. So what I think is interesting here is on the one hand, the question of refugee management and those spatial legal um, policies, procedures that have an impact on them, for example, waiting in an accommodation center um, until you receive your status or being detained as it is in the US for people um, applying for asylum defensively um, until they are released from detention in combination with the broader question of housing prices and internal displacement in cities and how these two trends, um, so to say, these two processes intersect with each other. So what I'm currently working on, and I say working on because it's a work in process, um, which is also why I'm happy to, to debate um, some of my findings and um, and 
ideas later on with you is um, I'm interested in investigating the conditions, policies, and practices that impact or result into this continued displacement, the fact that people may get um, continuously displaced in the city of the city of Brighton, and the experiences that are connected with these forms of displacement. And I'm also interested in the ways these different types, which are uh, for internal displacement, addiction, homelessness, and you have the right of internationally displaced migrants, how these different types of forms of displacement and experience of displacement intersect in the urban community home. And then, because I'm interested in structures and processes and everything, I want to know why. Well, what's the logic behind that? Why is that the case? And also coming from a little more Marxist geography of like who profits from that? Why is that the potential state, the potential racism, the discrimination, or what what are the logics of that behind that, right? So that was just the introduction. I haven't really started <laughs> today. I well, there, as you can see, there are a lot of points here. I'm, I will see how in time. I probably will not cover all of them, but I hope that I get like the gen, that I hope I hope that I'm able to kind of like bring you the general idea that I have in mind. Um, I want to start with talking what I understand as multiplied displacement. Then I will go deeper into kind of like the two processes. Um, factors that I just explained in one kind of like the legal spatial um, side that is related to some of the um, some of the causes why um, asylum seeker migrants experience the continuous form of displacement after arrival. And then second, I will dive more into housing and how housing markets, housing procedures, housing responses impact um, continued displacement or multiplied displacement. In number three, I will then um, go into the question of well, why, you know, what, who's profiting? Why is that the case? Is there some other problem? Why is that going on? Um, to then um, present some ideas for research to come, research that I want to do um, based on what I'm going to present today. And then I hope that we're going to have a fruitful um, discussion after that if I have not completely fallen to information. All right. Oh, yeah. By the way, so a, a lot of what I'm going to talk about um, today is published. Um, it's out there. I put some references also in the slide so that if you're interested in, you can follow up. Um, so some of the things, again, like I said, are out there already. Multiplied displacement. Why? What do I mean with that? Why I, do I think that's interesting? What are the challenges connected to studying this displacement of, again, the, the question of the legal spatial and the question of the, of the housing, the urban processes, right? Well, first of all, again, um, as kind of a, as an urban explorer that is interested in migration stuff, I've always been so surprised that there are <laughs> certain degree very different understandings of what displacement is in migration studies and what displacement is in urban studies. Um, in urban studies, very simply speaking, um, displacement is very much researched um, within the context of gentrification, um, urban regeneration, and the impact that it has on the displacement of racialized, marginalized class populations out of a certain area as part of um, very often financialized gentrification processes. In migration studies, simply speaking, my, uh, displacement is understood as kind of like this um, international um, process of migration where people, in a way, cross or displaced for very different reasons. And when it comes internationally, cross borders. So they are placed basically out of um, their country and have to have to force, you know, the voluntary, involuntary, you know. Um, a very blurry field, but kind of like have to um, move to another area, often leaving their home country. So there is some sort of a gap between those um, 
within or between the dis uh, disciplines and how they conceptualize um, um, displacement and diversity framework skills for and of displacement. Um, so this is kind of like a challenge that um, that I also seek to overcome. Um, the second point is there's a, some form of an empirical closure here is because migration and urban research has for a long time, it's been slowly changing the past couple of years, but has for a long time studied asylum-seeking populations as, um, as Ryaran says, as though they have no relation to the racial and class structures of the society in which they reside, even though they are governed in ways similar to how other racialized and marginalized groups and precarious positions within capitalism are governed. So they're always seen as an abnormality in a way, as something that is extra, that falls um, into a particular regime's particular procedures. And as I'm going to show in, in my presentation and generally in my um, research, to a certain degree, this is true because there are certain legal instruments, um, certain policies, certain laws, certain rules, particularly applied um, to asylum seeking and the large variety of people seeking asylum. But on the other hand, um, there are still integrated and part of particular structures that they, let's say, arrive in or need to um, overcome and cross and whatever. So um, this brings me to the third point, to understand exactly this entanglement between migration governance and kind of like the ordering of asylum-seeking populations and urban development processes. Um, I think I'll just skip the last one. There are a bunch of concepts out there. A lot of them, I think the majority of them, super recent that, for example, talk about accumulated homelessness as in um, the way it continued um, um, or um, migrants generally make experiences of continued displacement that results in different forms of homelessness that accumulate. Van Bar talks about predictability. Um, Umed Alis has a very interesting um, publication on displacement as violence and unhoming. Is it unhoming or unhousing? Mm -hmm. Unhoming, yeah, which I think is very relevant to particular violence um, aspect as part of um, um, processes of displacement that I think become, um, or is also very relevant in the field of forced migration and asylum, right? So I don't have the time to go off into all of those different concepts that inspire my work. But what I do think or what I do take away from those concepts is that displacement, simply speaking, is a process. Um, it is an experience that people have, that people go through. It is also a state in a way, which is why we have a lot of abilities, displaceability, disability, victimability. So a state um, in which um, people are in and may potentially experience displacement or addiction and such. Um, there's a violent component to it, the loss of home, the forced loss of home. Um, there's a racial component um, in a way, as there is class, question of surface housing, unhousing, um, generally the question of home, homemaking, how to make home, what is home, where do you make home, can you make a home in a refugee camp, or is the home a very, you know, particular um, meaning um, and what is related to that meaning? Profit and capital, especially if we talk about um, disposability, uh, um, exploitability in that regard. So this is kind of like what inspires um, my idea of multiplied displacement. So why do I talk about multiplied displacement? Again, just like a work in process. Um, idea in a way, but what I do um, focus on in my research are on the one hand the experiences of displacement that I see in my empirical work multiplying. Multiplying as in there are recurring and continuing experiences of displacement. So where issues of finding, making, and then losing a home and housing again come together. Um, for example, and I was, I didn't have the time, but I was thinking about putting that on um, kind of like a map, but 
um, a participant in the research partner of mine arrive in a detention facility, was then moved to another detention facility, then um, found um, housing with friends in an overcrowded form um, or an overcrowded apartment where he then had to move out, ended up in a homeless shelter again, then find a um, studio himself, and then was, I think, after a couple of months later, I guess, so, um, uh, right. so there's this continued um, kind of like experience of displacement, this continued sense of material and emotional loss that results from the lack of stable house, uh, of stable housing. And also the fact that one housing or one displacement experience may cause, you know, the sum may multiply in and of itself. The other or the second point um, that interests me is the multiplication of conditions through which people are displaced. So for asylum seeker migrants, there's a precarious legal status. Um, there's a violent legal spatial migration regime. There are borders, there are procedures, there are there is control, there's a lot of waiting, and there are violent aspects related to that. And this precarious status kind of like forms or builds a certain condition for displacement. There's racialization and discrimination um, because of status, because of other categories, for example, when it comes to access. Um, housing market, um, which is connected to the position of housing market. There's also a question of class, um, question, question of social networks when it comes to areas, uh, access or barriers to housing, um, and generally the question within um, the position of uh, or within um, regimes of housing market and the structures that um, racialized class based structures that people experience um, in cities in regards to general processes of marginalization in cities. Um, number three, I'm interested in and what I understand in multiplied displacement is not just how um, displacement experiences multiply, let's say, within the population of asylum seeking migrants, but how those experiences and forms connect and intersect with other forms of urban displacement. Um, what I will show throughout the presentation is, in the case of New York, in the case of Berlin, is that um, people, asylum seeking migrants and non asylum seeking migrants, are increasingly governed through similar mechanisms and processes. So there is kind of like an overlap. Um, in regards to um, to the way different populations are governing. Um, yes. Number four um, is the question of multiplied displacement as control and profit. So why are people in the loop of being continuously displaced and the profits from that? <laughs> So, I know, right? All right, so I come now to kind of like the first um, section um, that is on these legal spatial aspects that result in a presentation of trajectories or in this continued multiplied um, displacement. And a big portion of what I'm going to talk about is um, based on. Um, this one article which um, looks into legal spatial violence in the United States um, and Germany related to asylum. Um, and what I do think is interesting generally when we talk about asylum seekers, um, refugee people that arrive in the country to apply for protection is, um, but also in regards to other forms of regulation, is that there's a very deep entanglement between the law and space. Um, I quoted myself here from um, that paper, but I think it's very much to the point. The cyber laws cannot function without spatial technologies and practices. Refugee camps, detention centers, accommodation facilities, in addition to this personal and residential um, obligations, highlight the spatiality of asylum laws and policies. 
They are not only the right to regulate migrants' movement and place them in alternative legal or spatial regimes, but they are also spaces where migrants' legal rights are violated and access to integrating institutions are restricted. Um, so what I particularly mean when I when I when I talk about legal spatial violence is um, the way the law is used to regulate forced migrants, asylum seeking migrants through space, through different processes, including what I wrote down here, initial location, placement, transfer within a detention regime or reception regime detention and placement, residential obligations, um, segregation processes, forms of secondary um, migration processes, all of which result of, well, first they are applied to different degrees depending on national, regional, local context, but all of which secondly result in forms of replication and prolonging of trajectories. Why? while rights, for example, rights to mobility, um, which is particularly significant in the, within the EU context, um, are taken away to a degree. Um, to kind of like explain what I mean here is, I want to um, provide you an example of a small town close to Berlin, like 30 minutes, 45 minutes outside of Berlin. Um, that kind of like covers all of these um, um, of these little categories or processes that I mentioned here. So this small town kind of like ended up in the past couple of 15 years even um, to become kind of like a container um, for people that apply for asylum or for other immigration statuses in Berlin, but are then dispersed through legal dispersal regimes to the small town. Um, so what I'm showing here is, for example, if you follow the pink um, kind of like dotted line, you see there's a, there's a number one on top of the, of the map. This is where people arrive in a central um, accommodation facility. From this central accommodation facility, they are. They either have to leave um, this small town because deportation or other procedures, or they are then further um, um, distributed to this neighborhood in the south, which um, is currently referred to as Little Syria or Damascus, um, or back then, 15 years ago, it was the Red Square because a lot of um, people from. Uh, former Soviet Union countries were also distributed to that city. Anyways, they focused on refugees. Um, to then move within the social housing area in the South to eventually after residential obligations, because um, in Germany, if you are personal, you have to decide in a distributed locality for two years, they end up leaving the small town. But you basically have a very long spatial temporal processes of people being moved around just in this very little small town to after a certain time, usually depending on the government, sometimes it changes to two years, sometimes to three years, they are then free to move wherever they want to move, and usually they leave the small town. Um, I can skip that. Um, another example. Um, for this, and based on research that I did in New York, um, are detention facilities. And generally, the detention regime as um, a means to not only control movement, but to kind of like keep people constantly moving. There is this idea that detention or even refugee camps produce immobility. But what also takes place at the same time is that people are constantly mobile, they are constantly moved around within a detention facility, but also within a detention system in a way. There's one example of an interview partner that I had in uh, this Essex country correctional facility um, that arrived at the southern border, was then um, in a detention facility right at the southern border, then in one close to Los Angeles, then in Minneapolis. No idea why, you know, usually it's related to like bad quotas, 
um, and feeling bad to then eventually end up being moved to the New York facility. And that person had no, um, he didn't even know like where exactly he was. He knew that this is somewhere in New York City, but he didn't know that actually the detention facility that he was in was kind of like just two miles away from the central building. I bought it. Um, also, side note, what is interesting here in New York has been very good at like, keeping detention facilities outside of the city. So uh, New York doesn't want um, any facilities itself, but when you have like on the streets or JFK airport, those are usually the facilities you end up in. Um, yeah, maybe this is a good impression of the, the situation that people are confronted with once they are outside the detention facility, because being released doesn't necessarily mean that this experience of being moved around, this experience of, uh, um, of containment and displacement are over, but they continue very often long afterwards because when asylum seekers are being released, they often don't find them for what they need because you are often released on short notice and very late at night. And sometimes you don't know any people here, you are in a foreign country, you do not speak the language. What do you do? Where are you going to go? Many of the people I know live in the city's homeless shelter system. And then you have some people who stay in subways or sleep in parks because they won't go to shelters because the shelters here are very violent. This is a quote from um, someone that was in detention and in the asylum procedures from the Queer Detention and Empowerment Project back in 2019. So for this legal spatial side that kind of like people are become immediately a part or even sometimes long before arrival, so to say entangled in, is that there's a production of places of transit, of stopovers that disrupt movement and migrant mobility projects, right? Fragmentation. Um, there's an internalization or it is connected to the internalization of borders, urban borderlands, especially if you look at this picture again, where you kind of like kind of like close to New York City, and maybe this is where you have relatives, but you are detained outside of it. There's like a wall that prevents you from engaging in the urban environment. Um, yeah, people are moved around, life in transit, yada yada yada, next you go to housing. Um, accommodation and sheltering. So I mean, Berlin and New York City feel like the best cases to, to do this research, even though obviously those are trends that you see elsewhere, Boston included, um, second most expensive city um, in the US uh, was what I was reading a couple of days ago. So they are increasingly in major cities, but even also smaller cities, unaffordable and unavailable housing markets and housing shortages. In Berlin, rents in both the private and public public housing sector doubled between 2009 and 2021. There's a housing crisis, a homelessness crisis, and on top of that, there's the arrival of the silent city migrants. Similar in New York, um, there are 60,000 people that are houseless or unhoused, 25,000 in Berlin, and those are the numbers without people that are seeking asylum, which are in both cities now actually the largest population of homeless or unhoused populations. Um, so we do have a situation here where, as Baga says, the arrival of asylum seeking populations takes place in an already burgering crisis of homelessness and affordable housing. And in that regards, I think it's interesting to see how people deal with that and what kind of like solutions ideas they come up with and how this impact on the trajectories of the asylum seeking migrants. Um, Berlin is a very interesting case because it's somewhere between emergency and permanence. Um, so on the one hand, in the past couple of years, the um, city has been developing a lot of temporary spaces to um, accommodate asylum-seeking migrants in situation of, situations of emergency. 
Um, luckily, we have two big vacant airports in the city that um, have been transformed um, to, in both cases, to um, accommodating asylum seeking migrants. Um, while at the same time, since around 2016, um, the city has been developing more permanent solutions to the refugee housing question, um, so to say, um, in the form of so-called MOOCs. MOOCs are modular housing for refugees. Um, they look as what you see on the right side of the slide. They kind of like look like a social housing block in a way. Um, definitely different compared to the pictures on the other um, side of the slide. Um, to a certain way, different to a camp or shelter in a traditional way. And they are designed as kind of like dormitory apartment style housing where um, asylum seeking migrants, asylum seekers in procedures are accommodated, trying to respect, for example, family sizes. Um, and things like that. Um, what is interesting about these MOOCs, really, and this is the largest public housing program in Berlin at the moment. It has like um, 1 billion um, euro incorporated into that program. And it kind of like indicates, as Sobach says, how the government is reacting to a situation that is shaped by a lack of public housing and a scarcity of public land. So there literally is not much the city can do, according to the city, other than creating these moves in order to respond to the need of housing and sheltering from asylum seeking application uh, from for asylum seeking um, people. As the city itself says, we left housing to the free market. Okay, you left them and missed early chances to develop affordable housing. And now we have a situation in which the tight market has pushed people to the edge, spatially and socially. The development of accommodation is our only real means to respond to this at the moment. And I think that's kind of like a very uh, shocking acknowledgement in a way um, to build refugee accommodation to respond to the housing crisis. Um, what is interesting about these moves though, also from an urban development perspective, is that they are aiming at increasing the housing supply in two ways. The first one is they provide housing for refugees in asylum procedures and increasingly those that have been granted for protection status. But in the second step, they are also aimed at being opened up for all other Berliners that are looking for housing. In fact, what we are actually talking about, if you see the numbers here on the map, 61% um, of the people that reside in these facilities at the moment are people that have a refugee status, not people in asylum procedures. So there are refugee burdens in a way um, that would be homeless if they would not be in those facilities. Um, and a majority of them, as you can see in the other graph, has been residing in those facilities for longer times, years, so to say. Um, so they are literally, especially if they are open up to other homeless populations, there are literally spaces of accumulated homelessness or um, even the, the State Office for Refugee Affairs refers to this form of housing Again, this is the office that kind of like is part of developing this, um, these moves. They refer to it as this is housing for burners from before, housing that contributes to the downgrading of already problematic areas. Okay, as you can see here, um, the majority of the, the dots and the squares are these moves. The majority of them are located at the outskirts and or in areas with. What in Berlin is referred to low or very low social economic status. Moving on to New York. I feel like doing research in New York, I was like, this is, it feels like Berlin 2015 in a way, crisis mode, 100,000 people arriving. Oh God, we didn't expect that. What do we do? We need 
identify emergency solutions as fast as possible, um, including developing the exactly office of asylum seeker operations. I think it's one of the first in the country, so kind of like a municipal office that deals with matters of um, asylum, asylum seekers, and um, an asylum seeker arrival center, both of which have been existing in European cities for probably the last 10 years. So I think it's an interesting development um, to see that um, in New York City in response to the question of how do we govern um, asylum seeking migrants in New York City. Um, what the city has been doing, it has significantly expanded its, its homeless shelter system. Um, I think they are currently running over 200 um, facilities um, for both populations, home, like homeless or unhoused populations and unhoused asylum seeking populations um, that, um, yeah, are referred to as homeless, uh, as um, emergency shelters, they are um, in hotels, um, kind of like tent places have been um, developed. So at the moment, there is um, not really a, um, kind of like a long term solution, but obviously, as we see in both cases, these processes take place against the bigger backdrop of the housing crisis. What is interesting in New York, though, is kind of like the only um, um, oh, what is special about New York is that it has the right to shelter. So compared to other cities in the U.S., New York is legally obliged to provide housing for unhoused populations, um, which um, is or has been what it's doing to a large degree, which is why it has opened up all of the shelter facilities because it's legally, legally obliged to um, provide accommodation for anybody regarding of status. But um, for around nine months now, this right to shelter is heavily under stress, criticized by the mayor, by the governor of New York, trying to restrict it, limit it in response to um, or for asylum seeking populations. For example, there is now a 30 day limit to stay in the shelter with 64 families. So, kind of like after 30 days, you are evicted from the shelter, you are placed in. Can reapply for shelter, but you might end up um, in another facility in the city, which particularly in New York social networks, family schooling, etc., is obviously problematic. Um, and the mayor Eric Adams in October announced um, that tents to newly arrived migrants will be passed out so that they can live in part and outdoors, other outdoor spaces. I want to be honest with New Yorkers, you're going to see the visual of running out of room. It's not if, it's when. People are going to be sleeping on our streets. I feel like it's, it's that the mayor of the city is kind of like already predicting and preparing and the situation worse to come um, is telling a lot, but also the kind of like response or the um, the ambition of the governor of New York to get rid or to at least restrict the shelter, um, the right to shelter, um, is also very interesting because it's very much in the logic of there are eight million. You can see it in, um, at the bottom. There are eight million, eight billion people in the world that they um, all would come to New York City. What should we do? We cannot provide space to all of them, so I don't think we should have a legal obligation to do so. Um, so obviously, this in both cases, urban and New York City, um, the question of housing asylum seeking migrants is related to the larger questions of housing precarity, housing financialization, housing shortages. Um, and for the New York case, um, even when I started doing research in New York City 2018, 2019, as kind of also you see in these codes, housing has already been an issue back then. It's accumulated for <laughs> all right so how am I I kind of like I stopped late with stopping my time how am I with time <laughs> um well let me summarize this section move over to profit and then I'm going to come to an end 
for this section, what we see particularly in, in the Bergen case, but also increasingly in New York, is kind of like this regime of sheltering, sheltering and an increasing amount of people that are sheltered as some sort of a new urban norm in a way, at least or in particular in the Bergen case, where it literally has become manifested in the form of these moves. So starting temporarily and um, uh, as emergency, but then become um, permanent. At the same time, just as in New York City, people in um, in Berlin that are um, that are housed in a move, they don't have any um, um, uh, what do you call it, tenant rights or something like that. So you literally can be evicted at any time if authorities are worried about you about the facility, about you can go to shelter. Um, or you may even come in back to the shelter after you find housing on housing where people have to be evicted from that housing. Um, so this is kind of like contributing to this continued spiral of displacement experiences. And at the same time, what we see um, in New York, in both New York and Berlin, and for, I mean, probably in the American context, that's not too surprising, but for me in the European context, it was, it's, it was that spaces such as refugee accommodation or homeless shelters increasingly become places of, um, of a diverse population. In the European context, there has been a lot of clear separation between sheltering refugee populations and sheltering homeless populations, and that has been in the Bergen case, increasingly merged together with these moves providing housing for um, a bigger portion of people in Berlin that is looking for housing. In New York City, a similar case, people in, for the past couple of years, not just in the last six months, that do not find housing, asylum seeking migrants that do not find housing, end up in the homeless shelter of the city. So people with very different displacement experiences, international ones, urban ones, different categories that are related to that, come together in this some sort of combined governance of people being differently displaced um, in a way. Yes. Um, the last part, making profit through displacement, that's one that I'm really um, excited about. Um, I will present some findings here for the Berlin case that I believe are super interesting and I'm still kind of like, I know it's like kind of like stupid, but I'm still proud of myself for putting that together, <laughs> understanding what is going on. I but I just it's not often proud of you. He won't hear why, he won't hear why. He feels like, look, Berlin housing crisis, um, shortages of housing. The city takes 1 billion euros to develop around 55 refugee facilities to house around um, 25,000 people. Why? Why is the city doing that? That was like my question. I was like, why not just build housing, social housing, whatever? Like, why? This form of housing, how is it how how is it done basically? So what is interesting here is mm -hmm. the way they literally plan, develop, um, and implement this housing, and it kind of works through three processes, three factors. The first one is the refugee building law, which is a special law that has been implemented in Germany federally. 2016 to um, kind of like ease the way to develop um, shelters because crisis. So shelters as many as much as possible. We need to develop them in this law, kind of like make it easier to develop sheltering spaces. The second one is there's a continued categorization and racialization of refugees in order to build and develop these shelters. I'll show that in a minute. I refer to that as status value in relation to, I think it's Norton's 21 or um, where she and Colin talk about the status, status value. And the third one is you can exploit and develop land through developing 
those accommodations. So there is a form of a spatial value. Sounds complicated. I take you in. <laughs> the building, the refugee building law. So it allows for fast track on bureaucratic development of accommodation. So then what the law does, it exempts from more or less housing standards. You can build housing, refugee housing, that does not have to follow legally the standards when it comes to housing. For example, when it comes to noise pollution, you can build one of those facilities next to the highway. You could not build housing, normal housing next to the highways with the normal cost. In the Berlin case, and here is where it gets interesting, this law has been applied to convert non-residential land into land for residential use for housing refugees. So land that legally could not have been used before or zoned before as housing, applying this law has been used to convert into residential use for the purpose of sheltering refugees. But as we know, later on, they will shelter a broader population of people in Berlin that are struggling to find housing. Quote, the refugee building law is a systematic way of putting areas into use that otherwise could not be put into use. With the refugee law, I can get access to land that I would otherwise not be allowed to build. That means that the refugee building law allows us to create special building areas that would otherwise not be available for the city of Berlin. And the second advantage is I can build much faster. Continued categorization and racialization of refugees. The law, the refugee building law, only allows the development of refugee shelter or accommodation for people in asylum procedures, not for people that have a status. What Berlin did, the Berlin solution is, it just invented another refugee category, status status change refugee. For those that have been given protection and residency status, but remain in accommodation because they lack housing. So you actually have normal refugee burden of, in a way, in those housing facilities that have been used to, um, have the, 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 where the refugee building law has been used to um, develop these facilities on areas where it should not have been developed on the normal building law. So there's a continued re-inscribing of this category uh, um, through this category and refugees and through this continued racialization are made valuable with regards to their status. And number three, um, as I kind of like highlighted with um, the code is, it allows this, this uh, refugee building law allows the city to access land that it could not have been accessed otherwise. So it can, can kind of like expand urban land for development, which is particularly interesting um, when looking to the ambitions of then Senator, now Senator, again, Andreas Geisel for urban development, who said, most will become the nucleus for the long-term development of an area for which new neighborhoods and residential areas can emerge. So it's kind of like used as Kind of like entering land to then further develop land. Who profits? I'm not going into that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not going into that. But looking where the money goes, and I'm, I earlier said I'm proud of that because it literally took me forever to understand where the money goes and how it goes. And it goes to basically two major actors. The first one is it's the public housing companies that are run like businesses and you know, are financialized that receive a lot of subsidiaries from the federal government and from the Berlin government to, um, to build and rent um, out these facilities. And it is private companies that 
construct them and then operate them. No, I'm not. Maybe it's part of the discussion, but there's a lot of money involved. There are a lot of people um, profiting in that regard. This is an overview of the operators um, involved in the field. Many or the majority of them um, privately held corporations or public companies. I'm coming to an end. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what I would have, what I would have liked to talk with you a little bit about is what comes next, the experiences of displacement, just briefly um, saying. So what I want to do next is I want to kind of like use the trajectory approach um, keep following the respondents that I already have, um, get in touch with new ones, and I kind of like want to learn about their experiences um, in a long-term way of displacement within the New York, within the Berlin context. I'm simply I'm sticking to the cases because I already have those contacts. I already you know, have some of the stories of people being moved or moving around in the place or against the backdrop of their multiplied displacement. Um, experiences and ideally in the long run, I hope to draw and develop a new theory of displacement and um, <laughs> yeah, bringing to merging migration and urban approaches to do that. So sorry for being a little too long. Thank you very much for your patience um, and concentration. And thank you so much. Well, that was a brilliant uh, inaugural speech from yeah, yeah. Boston Urban Salons. Not Boston. I'm sweating, so. You might be whining. Okay, perhaps questions. Well, thank you so much. That was a good one. But uh, obviously, this is a, a issue very close to home to us in the United States, but it's everywhere. I mean, especially after with the uh, they don't talk to the war, and you mentioned Syria, and they come to the when the receiver of these refugee war migrants. I guess I wanted to ask you, um, I wanted you to elaborate a little more on the comparison of New York and, and uh, Berlin. Because what's, what's, great, what's super interesting is, going back to the Eric Adams quote, and those of us who live in New England are really aware of the disaster in New York, part of this disaster is because of, and this is one comment that that fits into my question about the comparison. So in both cases, it's national policy that's setting this in motion a little bit, how the nation is receiving refugees to, and in the United States, as you know, you've been in New York, it's very conflictual, very contested. And half the reason some of these refugees are in New York is because they're being sent from Texas. And you know, we've got a federal system, you have in Germany also a federal system, but the, the, the different um, regional territories do not agree on the national policy. And I still agree with your focus on how they end up in cities anyway, but now they're in New England cities and not necessarily in, in you know, kind of Dallas and Austin, et cetera. So, but back to Eric Adams, so the fact that you underscored his quote about living in tents, I'm, I'm comparing that to what's happening in Germany, where the financialization, the private sector is right in there making so much money. Same process, same multiplied displacement, but in, I mean, I'm not sure this is true everywhere, but for those of us that are watching in New York, it's an opposite response or a different response. So if we understand capitalism is always looking for ways to make money, which is what you're focusing on, how do you explain the difference? If both in both cases, the national government, and I know Merkel was really in trouble for doing all that. So I mean, and, and I guess another way of asking that is we can look at the outcomes, but do some of, were some of these actors involved in the policy itself because they were anticipating the profitability, and is that the difference, or is it just serendipity because of U.S. politics is different? It could be the pandemic, maybe the kind of way the corporate world deals with Eric Adams is different. But can share a little bit about the comparison because yeah. I don't disagree at all with the kind of the larger analytic framework, but I'm super intrigued by the differences. Yeah, 
Can I add my question briefly to that? Sure. Um, I interpreted it slightly differently in the sense that I got, I, I understood Berlin having dealt with this longer. And I wondered also if they had learned to financialize yeah. um, this, you know, and exploit this problem for profit, whereas New York is now learning from them and looking to mm -hmm. Berlin and we might see or we might expect to see something similar unfolding in New York too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Or yeah, you know, or or is it different contexts? As or parties in power. Yeah. Different parties in power in Berlin, even though the national comments. Yeah. Super interesting question. Um I mean especially like your reference to the mayor's vote. I mean, I, I, I find it so hard to um, um, kind of like understand his rationale and why he thinks, uh, why he says mm -hmm. the things he says. I think a lot of the rhetoric he is using, he's instrumentalizing um, as kind of like pressure to pressure the federal government as in like, look, we got to have your people on the streets and in tents. Is this what you want? Give us money so we can do it. Right? So it's, it's, it's a little difficult to kind of like, or you, you really have to receive in a bigger perspective. And he also, like, he changes his opinion basically in every two weeks. It's like, <laughs> for sure. Um, so, but the quote for me was very, um, was very relevant because it kind of like showed, I mean, on the one hand, kind of like a someone who is overwhelmed with the situation and who literally says, this is what's gonna happen. And be prepared for that. That's, that's just gonna be the case. Um, in regards to the comparison, it's from, look, when I, when I started this research in New York in 2018, I did not need European journal mindset, right? <laughs> privileged in like in, in other ways. I asked my respondents, like, what do you mean people do not get twenty for? In Germany, <laughs> in Germany, <laughs> the largest cyber seeker, you literally arrive in the hands of the welfare state, right? You are provided with a form of housing. Um, you receive um unemployment the same level as a German citizen. So it's kind of like the, the welfare state hugs you, that hug can, is a form of control and has negative implications in many other ways, but it's there. And they were like, Renee, there is no state or welfare for anyone in this country. You are on your own in a way. What the hell don't you understand about it? <laughs> um, so it took me a while especially doing this comparison to understand that um, the context is very different. What I do think is interesting in New York and also in the, the context of the current shelter crisis and the ambition to literally get people out of the shelter with introducing this restriction is this very American understanding of self-sufficiency. You have to become as fast as possible um, response responsible for yourself because nobody else will. And if you cannot do that, nobody else will do it for uh, you. And it is your fault. You are the way. one in two places. Right. Um and I think when it comes to um, what 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 I've learned with, with the current debate in, in New York so far, um what it comes down to is you kind of like want to release the people as fast as possible into employment because you know that there are at least temporarily are going to occupy sectors in um, yeah the low wage sectors. Um, all of my interview partners, including asylum seekers, they basically when when you talk about okay, so what you include the ones that are staying at these shelters because they do not have housing yet, like what do you do for employment? Where do you get employment? There are usually two or three words, Uber, Lyft, Uber Eats. Um, there are 65,000 people in New York City that work in the, um, in the bike delivery um, uh, market in a way. Um, and a huge portion of those working in that market are asylum seeking migrants. So, 
S. Do I have? No, I didn't put it in. Where is this one? The the New York, it's on the state level. The New York governor released, that was just three weeks ago. I didn't put it in here, unfortunately. Released um, a report identifying um, suitable employment opportunities for asylum seekers in New York City. So it's kind of like a list that shows the sectors where there are vacancies. And those sectors are delivery, construction, care. Those were amongst the biggest. So I feel like in New York, the logic is compared to Berlin. In Berlin, the logic is we, we kind of like keep you in and profit from that in a way. And in New York, the logic is we need to release you as fast as possible. First of all, because we simply do not have the money because there is no federal funding. That's different than in Berlin. That is federal funding. All of it comes down to federal funding. We need to release you as fast as possible because it will become beneficial for our local labor market. And this is kind of like this, the second rhetoric or second narrative that um, that even the Migration Office for Immigration Affairs, the mayor um, that they're using is migration is good because we have a lot of um, um, unfilled um, um, unemployment opportunities in the city in those sectors that are migrant, migrant suitable. But it was really shocking for me when I was like, really found interesting that said a lot about how you know. Um, those migrants that have been arriving, how they are perceived, or how they think they can be used for. So is the UK an outlier because it's spending money on getting like migrants out? So the land <laughs> of the it's not yeah. it's money. Money. It's yeah. actually yeah. wasting money to <laughs> sending them to Rwanda. So I mean, well, is that just an insane outlier? Or? They are in many ways. I mean, the, the question also is that it's also like with um, coming back to, to Eric Adams and, and the quotes he gave, like, the, I think the question also is like, what is symbolism, right? I mean, will, was it Uganda where they have Rwanda, Rwanda exactly? Um, will this definitely, will this have an impact? Will it actually be implemented? Will it have an impact on migration governments? Or is it simply more um, symbol politics as in peace don't come? deterrence logics, right? Um, Can I just say that I yes. think you brought up Loretta's question. Sorry to jump in here, but I mean, what I, I'm thinking maybe in the next stage, can you hear after, but um, I mean, we're really talking about different national states. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned culture, and of course, the kind of cultures, it's also about the kind of the embrace of liberal, where do you want the continuum of full neoliberalism with kind of a social welfare state. So that's why the British case is kind of interesting. So not that you want to add a third case, but if you look at the bottom, <laughs> in there, we started understanding, and to me, the great paradox is of the three cases, the greatest, the closest to the old fashioned welfare state is the German case, but that's where the private sector is, is hitting all the time. Yeah. So it seems that you could pull that paradox out a little bit. No, it's interesting in the budget that it is, it is more sure in the private sector. But it's the private sector that's doing public stuff. Like public well, yeah, on the private it's development not... sector, because the private yeah. sector gets with labor, lower wages and, you know, in the other. The biggest problem, yeah, possibly, yeah. Um, in Berlin are the city-owned public housing companies. Yeah. Yeah. No, we there are six of them in Berlin. Yeah. Which have become many developers in their own lives yeah. across Europe. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, obviously, that, that's the question of like public private uh, mm -hmm. for profit. I mean, there are they functioning for profit. There are, um, um, what do you call it? Um, there are players at the um, what Wall Street? Oh. No. <laughs> 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 trade? Yeah, I mean, I trade it, yeah. Places. Security trading or whatever. Like they, they are part yeah. of like the whole financialized system, is what I said, right? Um, so but that's subsidized um, by the central government. So the federal government is silencing the loan for them. Even though, as in general, the US is a federal system, as is Germany, but exactly how the federal government lays out these policies 
And even with Eric Adams, it's a tension yeah. within the federal system. Yeah. Even the fact that Kathy Hochul is like, so even within yeah. the states, there are tensions between the city and the state level because, and then you've got the national level. So I just think it's an amazing yeah. research that you're doing and you could pull out some of these like governance contexts because governance was in the title yeah. in which we see these paradoxical outcomes yeah. of profitability. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think you also, you, you raised another interesting um, point, which really is the conflict between scales and between different actors. I mean, what you see here, and that's like, because every actor, I was, and I was interviewing all of those actors that you see, except for federal state, um, and no, I actually interviewed the federal state agency for real estate guys, but not like on the federal level, but all of like the city departments and actors, I all interviewed them, and nobody is a fan of these moves. Mm -hmm. You will not find a single public, um, first public actor of one of these institutions that says, greatest solution of all time. Everybody looks at like one of the, um, which is the state office for refugee affairs in an interview said, um, it looks like um, underground parking, but above ground. None of these actors is a fan, but what I do think is interesting here is these moves resulted kind of like as a compromise because there are so many different agencies. There is the um, Department for Integration, Labor, and Social Affairs, Finances, Urban Planning, Housing, State Office for Refugees Affairs, and they all kind of like have to make compromises on what they come up with. And they come up with something that they don't like. Um, it's profitable for, for others, but it's not necessarily a solution that mm -hmm. has been pushed up down through the years. Yes. But yeah, I'm so very conscious it's eight o'clock and we started a bit late. So if people want to grab some food and drinks, we can continue to talk and eat if you want, just for a short while. Yeah. yeah. Any of the students? I, I wanted to bring up the case of Massachusetts, since we also have a right to shelter law. And I happen to live two blocks from the overflow shelter for families. And um, so it's it's been interesting because I thought about when you talked about people getting moved, they expect people to be in this overflow shelter, which is um, a former courthouse that is shared with um, a not former registry of deeds where I've been working for 30 years. So I'm extremely familiar with this building. Um, and in fact, I was unbelievably psyched that they were fixing the plumbing in the building. I said, yes working bathrooms <laughs> but um they they're expecting these people to be there no and then they're going to move them into something more permanent yeah. and it's not just refugees or other immigrants um it's it's also local families mm -hmm. but just seeing the people because I've been um, out there a few times when they show up en masse in buses mm -hmm. with a Welcome to East Cambridge sign. Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you, they aren't getting much of a welcome. No. You know, and I, um, but it's, yeah, they, it's a very, it, I don't know where all the people are coming from and they, they are probably the same sort of um people who were transported mm -hmm. um but it seems to be largely haitians mm -hmm. um so there's also quite historically quite a haitian community here yeah yeah, yeah there there definitely are mm -hmm. um yeah the very first sunday they had um a pastor from a local haitian church to come in and, and do services for people who wanted it. But, um, you know, so far, I don't think Massachusetts has had the humongous influx 
that New York has, but it still created um, upheaval. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, while you're here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm currently obviously, in New York. I'm um, at the Brad Center, City University of New York. And this university is going to experience budget cuts um, from this year on. It's City University is experiencing budget oh. cuts, and um, it has to be explained in a way as the um, migrant crisis. Yeah. And, Wow. Taking up more than $1.3 billion of the city's budget, which is why the city has to take, has to take money out. So, they're closing for this university. But you were talking about what, you know, before this. Um, We've got some more. We just plus more. Yeah, but it, you were just talking about walking around. Yeah. Come to East Cambridge. <laughs> Um, I just have a question about like if public perception is a big role in comparison to like the government because I'm a New York resident and I received like the referendum things um about turning like the hotels and shelters into um temporary spaces. Um and as well as like multiple petitions, even though like I'm living in Boston now, I still received things in the mail. So I was just wondering like if that plays a role or like is that something that you can see as like partisan or something else? Yeah. Um, I feel like it, it, it goes and comes in waves in a way, at least that's for Berlin um, the case. I mean, I think that generally both New York City and Berlin are quite liberal and open cities that kind of like celebrate their um, migrant or migration heritage and uh, migrant communities up to a way that is also selling that and market that. Mm -hmm. Um, in a way, right? Um, I've been to one, um, uh, how do they call it, community board meetings, which was a completely fascinating American experience for me. Participation <laughs> <laughs> and early planning processes related to, I actually, the, the reason why I was going there, because the, the building that I'm currently uh, um, living in, is um, there's going to be another huge 20-story uh, development right next to the building. So I went with my roommate to this community board meeting and learned about the opening of the shelter um, for asylum-seeking migrants down the street. I was like, look at that cake, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are definitely, like on the neighborhood level, there are a lot of um, protests um, and kind of like, um, um, voices against the opening up of shelter. I think it also depends on um, the neighborhood. So for example, a lot of Brooklyn, more wealthy neighborhoods, the fear is, from the limited perspective that I have, the fear is it will devalue property uh, prices. Um, um, but I'm not too familiar with, for burden, I could definitely be we can talk forever about this because, because what is interesting is for every um, of these moves that has opened or planned, um, there has been at least one lawsuit um, coming and nobody in, in any neighborhood wants them. The question is um, always like why people do not want them and I kind of like separate three groups. The first one is what I've been just referring to in more wealthy neighborhoods is like Refugees, yeah, yeah, blah, blah, fine, but not here because our property prices will go down and will have a negative impact um, in more um, marginalized areas, particularly in Berlin East. It's racist protests. It's literally, we do not want refugees here. Um, and in more liberal, left leaning neighborhoods, as refugees, yes, welcome, but this is not the right way to accommodate them. They should, there should be normal housing. So there's also kind of like this nimby thing as, and of course we understand there needs to be housing, but not this way, not here, so no. Um, yeah, in nutshell. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned that these um, moves uh, also um, using to house like ordinary Berliners. I wonder if you could speak a bit more about this special category that they've created, because it's, it's basically an explicit rejection of those people's claim to be an ordinary Berliner. 
um, at the same time sort of pretending that they were responsible for the wealth in the country. Yeah. So what Irving is essentially doing is it creates kind of like a legal fact, which is it uses the law which only allows for building refugee shelters for people in asylum procedures. It uses the law to build those facilities, and once they are there, they're there. They will not be destroyed because it, it is against the law and it's created to house other people in them. Um, so I want to say up until quite recently, because they recently, uh, I think like in the last, it was by the, well, the end of COVID was the end of COVID, but I would say by the end of 2021, they first started to open these small facilities to house other um, non-refugee populations. Um, part of the reason was because of COVID and quarantine, you know, they needed more places, so to say. Um, so this is when they opened it up. What was my thought? Um, so I think during they they have been developed as kind of like this exceptional places, but I think the ambition is to have them to kind of like phase into more into as places that house well. Another category of otherness, which is the one that is not able to make it on the regular housing market. It still is quite clear. Like if you people know that oh this is a, this is a refugee facility, um, but this perception has slowly changed again. Oh yeah, it's well one of those things where like poor people, migrants, whatever. So there's kind of like. Um, and also the majority, as I was showing in this one slide, the majority of these facilities are located in areas that are already marginalized with government in their way. Um, yeah. And one last question from Carlos and I wish probably you can go for you. Yeah, if you want to think about it, you can tell me. I can no, ask no, okay. in the, yeah. I was just thinking about this. Um, throughout your presentation, and this was something that we talked about multiple times, and now it's taking another gentrification class, but like how difficult it is to research displacement, and like specifically you mentioned like talking to specific people and like hearing their stories, and like I guess she feels like how you can stop that, like if that was really challenging. Yes, um, I mean, well, first of all, I mean, there's my own positionality as a researcher, um, which I means this positionality is also the kind of like it is different in a particular context. I mean, it's definitely different in Berlin than it is before. In Berlin, I'm a white male journalist that is doing research ideally with, but in some cases, also just about um, refugee populations. Um, in New York, I feel like because I'm not received as an American, that kind of like, it, for me, it is easier to do research in New York. It is way more easier to, I mean, I talk to a lot of people in Berlin there too, but it's way more easier to talk to people at organizations, to talk to people um, at the city department. It's also easier, despite language issues, um, to talk to people on the ground, so to say, because I'm not generally perceived as the American, at least not once I opened my mouth to them, you know. Um, <laughs> so that kind of helps. Um, what is, um, well, I mean, there, there are a lot of challenges, emotionally, morally, ethically, um, when people become your friends, when people want to marry you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. So there are a lot of um of uh, 
um, challenges along the way. What I do um, try to avoid is I never, I, I usually uh, do not ask questions. I usually just let people talk and then ask questions. And I never, that's kind of that's my own personal rule. I never um, ask anything about um, their origin, reasons for migration, or the process of migration. I usually only ask questions related to their experiences once they arrive somewhere, whatever that arrive is, because it's not necessarily arriving. Um, and I do that both for me, but also for them, because especially like asylum seeking migrants constantly in a state of being questioned, um, having to legitimize their reason for being here. I don't want to contribute um, to that. Um, but also, I mean, I, I say it as it is, I don't want to hear the sad stories. Like, I, I, there's only a very particular limit of stories that I have to take. And I just feel like it's not necessarily for what I'm academically interested in. People want to talk about with that, and they feel comfortable because I know them already a bit, and I'm fine with it. But for like the first interview, that's like something not that I will engage in with. Um, and really, I think what shakes my research is that the majority of people that um, that participate in my research participate in my research. I know them for a longer time. Um, so they're kind of like is there's there is always kind of like a power imbalance and barrier because um, you are in a certain position you are you have a certain nationality but there is to other degrees also a professional friendship I want to say um, yeah. yeah. Carlos, do you want to ask a question more up there? Oops. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say like as we were all breaking the cards, it's really hard to ask the interviews, but since I'm already here. I I don't know if this is already asked, but if it has been, I sincerely sorry about this. But you did mention uh, during the presentation that MOOCs were um, sort of being developed in places where it was formerly commercial or for formerly non-residential land. Yeah. Um, can you define or can you go more about what that meant? Is that like yeah. formerly industrial, commercial, or was it just, you know, I guess, still, uh, for lack of a better term, unexploited land or something? Yeah, unexploited land, land, yeah. land. Mm -hmm. land I think that's not what we call it. Unexploited land, I think is, is the um, appropriate term. Um, where have we been? But is it, and can I add on to that, is it, was it publicly owned land? Um, and or some- privately owned? A very important question. I want to say the ratio is 40 60, 40 uh, private, 60 public. Mm -hmm. But then the question is what is public land? Well, yeah. um, and in from the 60% public land, I want to say also around 60% is federally owned public land, mm -hmm. um, which is also why mm -hmm. the public housing companies profit is because. They get the land relatively cheap, um, and they rent. They sort of say they rent it out to the state um, office for refugee affairs. They kind of like pay rent to the housing companies um, to house refugees in those facilities. So when we talk about rent for a refugee, it's a rent for a person. And that um, rent, so to say, is 600 euros per person per month. But that one person um, occupies way uh, less space than in normal housing, that would be the case. The average is between six and nine square meters. Oh, sorry, American. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a lot of space. So <laughs> The, the, the square feet price of housing in Mook is comparable to the luxury housing in the city center of Berlin. This is how they, the um, money works. That was not your question, though. You had a completely different question. I mean, it was pretty much about the land. So uh, yeah. the majority of the land is what in, in Berlin planning law um, called is 
undesignated urban area. So it's literally um area that does not have a purpose yet. I see. There are a lot, there are still, even though it's 30 years ago, but there's still some of this land um, converting because of beautification, converting land from socialist to um, capitalist um, ownership system. Um, that's majority of land, but it's also commercial and industrial. And sometimes it's literally um, next to, let's say, um, a, a building was destroyed in the Second World War. There was a big highway built next to it. And because there's a big highway, that certain property could not have been used because of noise and air pollution. But now, with this law, it can. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.